We begin with the raging crisis in Sudan, which has left at least 7,000 Nigerians, including students, trying to escape the crossfires. A desperate effort by the Nigerian government to take its citizens to safety initially suffered setbacks after authorities in Egypt denied them entry, insisting that the fleeing Nigerians must have entry visas into the Egyptian border. The fighting started on April 15 between uh, the Sudanese army and paramilitary group RSF which are both headed by army generals. Now, over 400 people who have been killed in the violence and many countries, including the US and Saudi Arabia, have commenced the evacuation of their citizens. Meanwhile, in a joint press statement, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development at the end of an assessment of the situation noted that the first batch of 13 buses conveying 637 evacuees had arrived, the identified safe borders at Aswan in Egypt, where they are undergoing necessary documentation and clearance before admission into the Egyptian territory for their eventual evacuation to Nigeria. The statement uh, further said that the movement of the second batch of 29 buses will commence on Saturday, uh, April 29, which is uh, today. The evacuees are advised to be at the designated locations with only one luggage. Meanwhile, uh, the Nigerian Air Force uh, has uh, dispatched an aircraft alongside um, airliner airpiece uh, to the area where both the airpiece and the Nigerian Air Force aircraft will be uh, doing the evacuation uh, from Saturday and uh, to help us understand and make sense of all that is happening, we have joining us now uh, the head of the Department of Public and International Law, Nile University here in the Nigerian capital, Abuja. He's Dr. Siraju Yakubu. Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us. Thank you very much for having Yes. Me. Talk to us about this looming humanitarian crisis we have in the northeast uh, region of the continent. Sudan, which used to be the largest country on the continent before South Sudan was excised from it is now all at war with itself and Nigerians are trapped there, many of them students who want to come back home. Although we have a huge number of Nigerians, people, some people say between four to six million uh, that have stayed in that country, lived in that country for, uh, you know, several centuries. Uh, but the ones who want to come home now are, are the students and those who are uh, have gone to do one or two businesses there. So talk to us about all of these evacuation efforts, including the latest by the Nigerian government. Yes, uh, thank you very much once again for having me. And um, uh, you see, it is quite unfortunate what is uh, happening uh, right now in Sudan. Uh, I could remember talking to a friend uh, who is uh, a Sudanese, uh, uh, who was telling me uh, at that time, I think about three years back, his concern that um, uh, the fact that uh, the former military ruler has been deposed. Omar al-Bashir. Yes, Omar al-Bashir. Uh, it's not that very good for the country. Not because he was deposed, but the seeming instability. He specifically mentioned uh, him, uh, this, the head of the rapid the militia. The RSF, Hemeti. He, yes, Hemeti. Uh, General Dagalo. Yeah, exactly. He mentioned him as a destabilizing factor and we, we can see for whatever reason um, this is happening in, in Sudan I think uh, it is quite unfortunate having at least brokered uh, you know some peace before and um, even on a transition to democratic rule I think this war is a serious uh, setback to democracy in Sudan and um, back to the main issue of uh, the, the humanitarian crisis in fact I think uh, this war uh, in Sudan is, it will, will, will be the first time, to my knowledge, that um, uh, fighting, serious fighting is concentrated in Khartoum, which is highly populated area with so many, um, with millions of people uh, living there, including uh, foreigners. Before it were in Darfur, it was in south, uh, southern Sudan, and, and so on. So we are seeing Human, uh, humanitarian crisis like never before in Sudan. Now, um, our students who are there, actually uh, our thoughts are with them and with their, and with their families. And um, what, we, what we'll say that uh, government should do everything possible for it to uh, uh, evacuate them back home. Because if you look at Sudan itself, 
is surrounded by countries that themselves are not stable. Chad, Libya to the west, I think. Uh, if you look at um, Ethiopia, in Tigray region, it is, uh, it is also having a serious crisis there. So the situation is unique that, uh, that, the, that the government is, uh, is have need, need to act urgently. I'm so happy uh, to hear that uh, the government actually is uh, trying its best to bring uh, our, our citizens uh, uh, back home. Yeah, Safely. I mean, with the latest information being that the government has sent the Nigerian Air Force aircraft and then APC, uh, which is a private airline now, will be heading to uh, Egypt to see how they can evacuate all of this. But talk to us about uh, the people who have been trapped there and uh, the actors, the major actors, the two actors who are there, the two generals who are fighting. Have they broken any international law with some of the actions that they've been undergoing? If you look at it, a Turkish aircraft just uh, tried to arrive to pick people just when they had the ceasefire between yesterday and today. Mm -hmm. And they shot at uh, the Turkish airliner. And a lot of people are beginning to say, I mean, shouldn't there be a control between both sides when it has to do with, I mean, aircraft coming to evacuate people? These are not military aircraft. These are aircraft coming to pick people out of safety and yet they have been attacked. Yes, I think uh, under the international law, the two warring sides have an obligation to give safe passage to, uh, to the people that have been evacuated. That is in addition to other responsibilities in keeping uh, civilians safe because uh, civilian who is not uh, holding any arm, who is not in any way direct, uh, I mean, are involved in the, in the, in the conflict. They, they need some protection and the international law has uh, protected them. But whether some international law has been breached there is a matter of uh, investigation. At the moment, we don't, ha we, we, we don't have the facts. But um, uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, uh, laws that uh, govern war, uh, especially the, 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 the so-called law of uh, I mean, uh, international uh, human, humanitarian law that regulates how actors to fight and um, the, 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 that uh, gives uh, sort of protection to both even the military in fighting because uh, when uh, wounded, those who have surrendered, they need to be treated. He, he, the yes. popular Geneva Convention exactly. applies in all of exactly. this. Exactly, yes. And in addition, we, we even have, yes, of course. So you can see that um, uh, 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 if the two generals do not respect international law, it can result to something else, because uh, lost, lost of innocent lives will be, will, will be lost. And uh, as, a, as a result, I think uh, the International Criminal Court may come to, to, to their door uh, knocking uh, some, some other day. Okay. Mm. Well, uh, Khartoum is starting to empty. That's the yes. latest that we're hearing, despite all the ceasefires that have been negotiated, and yet there's been a violation of those ceasefires. But let's talk about other countries that have uh, stopped uh, other citizens, including that of Nigeria, from just getting in. Mm. Egypt, for example, and Ethiopia are the case studies here. Mm. Nigerian students who are fleeing the war zone uh, are lucky enough to get to the borders, but then you have these countries asking for documentation. These are people running for their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, in the spirit of um, uh, uh, pro the protocols of the African Union, shouldn't these countries relax some of those restrictions and see how things go on at the moment? Yes, you see, generally speaking, not only Africans, but anybody who is now in Sudan deserve protection, and they have protection under the Geneva Convention. Um, the issue is uh, the, the, the Geneva Convention defined uh, uh, refugees narrowly and that is what is affecting not uh, most people are trapped in, your, in your world, not only in Sudan but elsewhere like with the conflict in Russia and, uh, and Ukraine as well that narrow definition is actually what is affecting uh, the safety of uh, life who the laws uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, protect and who it doesn't protect. But to me, I think the law should be given uh, wider or broader uh, uh, meaning to um, to to make uh, every a, every civilian within a war zone as 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 a as a refugee. Because uh, according to the convention, those who are regarded as uh, refugees are those people who are for one reason or the, or the other, 
they cannot stay in their country because they are going to face persecution for their political uh, belief, for their religious belief, and, uh, and, uh, and other beliefs. Now, even the LGBT uh, 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 are actually uh, making claims under those uh, provisions. So, like in our own case now, the students, Nigerians that are living in Sudan, Sudan is not their own country, but they are there as students. If we take the narrow definition, then they will then 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 they will not be then they will not be covered and then coming back home to africa the same uh we have uh the oau convention uh governing spe uh, specific aspect of re uh, re uh, refugees and that convention uh, uh i mean i mean the was uh was uh, uh you know signed by the african uh, by, the, by the parties in uh, in 1969 same problem it is diff it's not, it mirrors the definition in the in the in the in the in the Geneva Convention. But however, if we apply the broader definition, that we will realize that yes, even uh, I mean our own students who are actually uh, whose um, uh, Sudan is not their own country, they are they are uh, they are covered by that. Uh, 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 you know, provision of the of the of the convention specifically, you know, uh, Article Three. Article Three made it clear that no country should. Article Three of this uh, African Union Convention made it, uh, uh, I mean, an obligation on African countries not to reject a refugee at the border. Who, not, who is not fleeing a war? Yes. Situation. Yes. Then, if you take it, sorry. Okay. Then, if you take um, another. Uh, at the protocol uh, to the treaty establishing uh, uh, African economic uh, community on the movement of people, you realize that section uh, uh, article, uh, article 6 of that uh, protocol actually uh, article, uh, article 6 one actually guarantees free movement of people African people within African continent and no. visa is not required. Visa Do, is not during, required. That is during a, such a, a, a crisis. No, no, no. When it is even peaceful, because, because this con this uh, protocol, it was a convention on um, a free movement of uh, persons to do their economic activities, including study, including uh, research, including business, even at time of peace, because that will happen uh, when when there is peace. Um, the the protocol uh, requires that no country should stop, should refuse entry of another African into its country. And if a visa is not required, and the uh, anybody who moves uh, from one country to to another can stay for nine so, days. So in other words, uh, visa. Ethiopia and Egypt seem to be violating the, 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 the African AU protocols. Yes, okay. we, uh, EU, uh, EU protocol on the pre movement of uh, of uh, persons. persons and yes, no. under the under and under the convention establishing the African economic community and they are also violating uh, uh, article two uh, paragraph three of AU uh, OAU convention governing uh, governance uh, specific aspect of of uh, uh, refugees. So they are clearly... All, all right, now let's, let, let's get back home with yes. the Nigerian government. Yeah. Shouldn't President Buhari have opened a direct line of communication with Abiy Ahmed, for example, the Ethiopian uh, president, considering how close they've been of recent, including Abiy Ahmed coming to Abuja here, why, why does it look like we have, you know, a poor relations uh, between both countries' leaders when Previously, not quite long ago, we've seen both leaders exchanging visits. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, like you said, the ideal thing to do when we are confronted with crisis for a leader of any country is to actually immediately establish contact with the leaders in the in the in the in the countries where the I mean in the country where the crises are happening and in the neighboring countries with a view of creating safe passage, safe passage for our own citizens, but. 
I don't know whether that has been done or it has not been done. I don't know. But I know if it, if it has been done, definitely the government would have issued a statement. So if it has been done and the government has not finished, uh, I mean, issued a statement, I think it is high time for them to, to, do, to issue the statement now so that at least citizens will have confidence in, in, in yeah, the well, government. Yeah, well, I mean, with the one they issued yesterday, there have been lots of controversies, including uh, with the $1.2 million that was sent out for uh, buses to be chartered. We heard that some of the buses stopped midway uh, and refused to go on. But this latest statement is saying that all is well and that the Nigerian government is urging people to stop posting all sort of things in the social media. It looks like the government itself is embarrassed. But sh shouldn't uh, citizens, you know, uh, voice their concerns, especially those who are stranded there, who have been sending videos, including to Arise News, and we have to ask some of them. Uh, what do you make of that criticism which the government is trying to parry, the $1.2 million sent for evacuation? Well, uh, not only government, uh, the government that is embarrassed, even us citizens actually, uh, uh, we are embarrassed by, you know, hearing that $1.2 million uh, is um, uh, actually... I know released to hire just 40, uh, uh, 40 buses. And um, when I did some calculation, the, the, the amount per bus is about 22 million. I don't know how much uh, the, the, the luxurious bus uh, you know, uh, cost, well, but at least <laughs> so it's a, it's a zone, huge so amount maybe. of money. But the government mm. has come up with an excuse that it is uh, a war zone. Which is a reasonable excuse also because there's competing demand for the buses. What I think uh, we can say is that government would have taken actions, uh, action a long time ago when this uh, uh, fight uh, broke out because obviously it was very clear that there was no end in sight. Uh, uh, for the yeah, I mean, the Minister of Foreign Affairs had said that there was no contingency plan because they didn't think that it would escalate to the extent. And people are beginning to question those who are actually in Nigeria's foreign ministry. Does it look like we're unprepared for the safety of our own citizens? Do we have to wait for it to get so uh, intense like this before we have to start evacuating our own citizens? Not at all, because um, I think um, if you look at the situation in Sudan, Sudan is a country that has never been st has not been stable for quite some time now, and um, with um, the with, with with the two people, with the marriage of the two groups, military and a militia force, you can know that that marriage is not a solid one, and um, whenever there is a, a small crisis, we should have expected that that crisis. Can, uh, linger for a very long time. Yeah, especially yes. considering this uh, General Dagalo, who was known to have done all sort of things exactly. uh, in, in, in uh, you know, South Sudan. Uh, remember that time Darfur. that they had, yeah, that Darfur, Darfur, I mean, yeah. that Darfur crisis and all of that. Yes. Uh, uh, but let's uh, come back to the latest statement by the Nigerian government. What I'm reading here says that uh, uh, some Nigerian students who found their way to the Ethiopian border were allowed entry into Ethiopia following the interventions of some Nigerian leaders. So apparently the line of communication has open. been opened uh, yeah. between that. Uh, but we're also having others helping out. I mean, the United Arab Emirates uh, is said to have ferried some of our citizens to Saudi Arabia from where they are going to uh, uh, be, uh, uh, you know, uh, lifted to Nigeria. Uh, let's talk about how this issue is one that points to our own lack of contingency plan for uh, our citizens who are in other parts of the world. Uh, what lessons can we learn from this? And then should we be depending on others to express their goodwill to us uh, before we take action? What can we do to learn from this situation? Well, well, Nigeria as a giant of uh, Africa, as we always call ourselves, I think we should have um, you know, plans, plans including contingency plans because we talk about contingency plan if you have a plan. So <laughs> it means that if we don't have contingency plan, we don't even have a plan. So we should be having plan. Our foreign affairs ministry should uh, buckle up. Uh, and then, well, we have to commend them. I know they are not sleeping, but at least they have to buckle up because um, lives are at stake there so that they should always plan they have information, of course. They have uh, a source of intelligence that should tell them in good time that crisis is brewing 
in a particular country. And we all know those countries that are not stable. We may not necessarily have plans for, to evacuate our citizens, for example, from the United Kingdom or from any European countries or from the American countries, countries because they are stable countries. Mm -hmm. But those countries that are not stable, especially in Africa and in Asia, we should immediately, we should uh, at all times, sorry, have a plan, a plan. Budgeted money, budgeted money does not mean that it has to be released. Or even if it's released and it's kept somewhere, yeah, because of the urgency involved in a, uh, in a crisis situation, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, it should be used. So any money that has not been used can be returned back to the treasury at the, at the end of the year. And then plan again, keep some money, make a very good plan. How are we, if we are confronted with this, how many Nigerians are on ground? The, 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 our embassies in those countries should have uh, the numbers. Are there, are there, yeah, are and then uh, you raise a critical the point there, mm -hmm. the issues of intelligence gathering. Yes. And I thought that was the reason why we had the National Intelligence Agency, the NIA, which helps us look uh, you know, beyond globally. our borders yes. uh, globally. Shouldn't they be working with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to provide real-time intelligence as to when things can get awry instead of allowing our students and other Nigerians to just get stranded and it looks like we don't have a government in place. Yes, yeah, you are right. And um, the NIA and um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I think they are, they are like two entire because they are, they, they are, they are actually working together and uh, including other agencies. Of course, uh, the intelligence drive should be more aggressive more aggressive in the sense that we should be on top of our, of, of our game because uh, of our game because I know the the cardinal principle of any intelligence service is to nip a threat in the boat. It shouldn't be manifest. So if that is the case, then intelligence is critical. We should know what is going to happen in the next one year, likely to happen in the in the in the next one year because of the indicators on on ground, and then. Uh, our intelligence services should be more concerned with what is going on in the head of the policy makers of different countries, not just react when things want, uh, 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 want to happen. Meaning that they should be more concerned with, um, you know, you know, you know uh, covert intelligence operations to, to, to have a clear picture of what is going to happen. Yes, because if, you could, because if you could remember, sometimes back, there was intelligence uh, by the United States that Nigeria will even dis disintegrate in, in 2015. Whether Nigeria will, dis will disintegrate or not, that's, that's not the issue. But the issue is that that intelligence or, pro or projection they, they have will help them prepare for emergencies in case Nigeria has has, has, I mean, is engulfed in, in the crisis. So we should be having something like that that will guide our ongoing back home here. So, so that when there are crises uh, in other parts of, uh, of the world, we can quickly evacuate our, our own people and safeguard our own assets there. All right. Um, uh, just before I let you go, I mean, I can't run away from that $1.2 million controversy. Now, this is what the government had to say, uh, and I'm quoting their statement, and that the outcry over the negotiated sum of $1.2 million for the buses hired for the exercises uncalled for, the amount in question was negotiated in a condition of war and where there are competing demands for same bus services by other countries also trying to evacuate their citizens, therefore, the cooperation understanding of all and sundry is required. Uh, and Nigeria has been unnecessarily critical of their government in all of this. <laughs> From the government's perspective, you can hear it now. Yes. And then the second question is, just before I let you go, you're mm. a researcher. Why do we have lots of Nigerians, especially those from the north, wanting to study in Sudan? Yes, okay. Uh, the first question. You see, I think that uh, our government should take, it, should take the criticism in good faith and... Uh, I learn from it and uh, and make things better uh, in uh, in future. What I mean is that assuming that when Nigeria said 1.2 has been released, they should have explained why the amount reached 1.2, and that would have solved the problem. People would not be uh, you know coming up with this level of criticism. But ordinarily person will think that are we buying the buses? <laughs> you understand. I mean, That's why, of course, yeah. people will 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 have to uh, cry out. Ah, why, 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 why 1.2 million dollars? 
when one that probably that money can buy uh, up to that uh, 40 buses. So that explanation that the Congo was now would have come earlier on with the announcement that 1.2 for even Nigerians to, uh, to, to, to understand the kind, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, the, the death situation, situation that our citizens ground. have found themselves. Yes. Then, yeah. um, you know, Sudan has been a center of uh, knowledge, especially, not, not only, if, uh, you know, uh, especially for Nigeria, not only people from the north, but uh, for the for, for the for the whole country, because I can remember in the past, Nigeria depended on on Sudan to 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 I mean to teach in our in uh, in our schools. So yeah, especially in northern Nigeria. Yes, especially in northern during, Nigeria. Uh, immediately after independence. Exactly. Uh, the because of lack of manpower. had to source a lot of manpower. Exactly. From that country. But still now. Sudan is still a, a, a center for, for, for knowledge. People who seek to learn Arabic, they go to Sudan. Those who are reading, uh, I mean, um, I mean, I mean, Islamic I mean, law and yes, Islamic law so. and pro and of recent even medicine, even even medicine. Our 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 we have we have students who have been, you know, Nigerian citizens that have been, you know, um, are trained as doctors in. And in Sudan, and even though because of instability, the, uh, definitely Sudan is better than than Benin Republic here. And we have students there going for law, going for medicine, uh, as right. so on. So Nigerians, because of our population and because of our zeal for knowledge, you find Nigerians traveling far and wide, everywhere yeah, in the world to technology. Yes. All right, uh, mm -hmm. most thank you so much, uh, Dr. Siraju Yakubu, is the head of uh, Department of the Public and International Law of Nile University here in Abuja. And of course, uh, the action is happening along the Nile in yes. Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the controversial <laughs> Nile between uh, Sudan, Ethiopia, and, and uh, Egypt. Egypt? Of course. And uh, uh, that, that will be another story for another day. Yes. But we must thank you immensely for joining us to understand some of these issues. And we hope that our citizens um, arrive in Nigeria safely. Thank you.